I've got about 40, 14 minutes and 30 seconds to discuss the, uh, the current status and future predictions for the global supply chain of electronic components. Good luck with that. Um, this is very much your warm-up act for today. Most presentations after this are going to be overtly more technical than this, but it is important that we understand the world we live in. And turmoil and change has been two, have been two defining words for the semiconductor business in the time that I've, I've certainly been involved, which I joined the industry in 1978. And um, since then, we've just seen a tumultuous growth and change throughout that period. The sine wave is probably one of the most symbolic um, descriptions of our industry. It's, it's, because it's, a, it's a benchmark of its, of, of its own. It's also very, very descriptive of the supply chain and its habits over the last 37 years. It's been very much a boom and bust existence. And um, if you look, since 1985, which is where I've started the measurement from on this, Every five to seven years, we've seen a cyclical boom of technology followed by a bust in the economy. And there are reasons for that. And I don't want to dwell on them today, but what I do want to do is to just show you them so that it gives us a, 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 a good idea as to why the industry behaves like it does, but more importantly, what's going to happen in the future. And just as a watchword, if we look at the industry today and in, future, in previous peaks and troughs, the economists have always looked behind to predict the future. I'm going to, uh, my prediction today is that you can't look to the past for the future because we've seen a quantum leap in technology adoption in the last five years that will carry on for the next 15 to 20. And I'm hopeful, hopefully I can prove that today. That, and I apologize for the graphic, but I pulled it straight out of a presentation. That has been the behavior of the semiconductor business since 1985. The word stability doesn't begin to enter it, okay? It is a volatile business. It has been a volatile business, and it will continue to be. Sometimes because of technology itself, but, but otherwise it can be other issues such as geopolitical or economic, or as we've experienced in the last three years, a pandemic. Just going back in history for a moment, we had the PC boom in the early 80s and mid 80s. Then we had a mobile phone boom, a dot com boom, a laptop boom, and a smartphone boom. And currently we're going through another kind of boom, but we'll discuss that in a moment. But these were all what I term as single technology booms. It was a PC, it was a mobile phone. And all the semiconductor companies geared up to supply this endless market that was never endless. It, at one point, it saturated. And when it saturated, they're all followed by significant slumps because the supply of product overshot the demand. And as soon as that happened, the market went into decline. Okay. It's not the case in everyone because there have been other aspects that have caused uh, declines, such as economics. But if we look at the global evolution of the semiconductor industry, for those of us that have been around long enough, it's, it was all started primarily in the US by companies that have become symbolic with the industry. Very closely followed by the emergence of the Japanese in the 80s, especially in the memory market. Then we had the Koreans and the Taiwanese. And then really from 2010 onwards, we saw mass consolidation of some of the more traditional semiconductor companies in Silicon Valley, taken up by some of the larger organizations that had emerged. And now we're facing the, the, uh, the awareness and onslaught of um, China. And without, without actually uh, promoting another slide, over 250 semiconductor companies exist in China that haven't actually exported any product at all, as yet. How am I doing for time? What, 10 minutes. Global chip sales look something like this, from 2015 to 2023. If, if, you, if you can remember pre-pandemic, just before then, the industry was not in a great shape. The market wasn't fantastic. Uh, we weren't sure where the market was going, but since then, and some of it may have been caused by the pandemic, certainly some of the technology sales with people being based at home, the market's gone into a steep up and to the right trajectory. That's a bit of an eye chart, but it gives you the foundation of how the business has grown in terms of the semiconductor companies themselves from 1993 through to 2021. Two names dominate nearly all the way through, Intel and Samsung, but these are what we call pure play semiconductor companies. Okay? It doesn't include companies such as the foundries, which I'll talk about in a moment. Today, 
the chip business, the semiconductor business, is worth something in a region of $650 billion. Okay. In 1985, that was a number of sub, well, it was a few billion. It might have been three or four. So you can see the tumultuous growth that is experienced in that period of time. But, and this is where I think it gets really interesting, instead of having single technology booms that we've seen in the past, we're now undergoing amazing change. And the difference with these markets is that they're all interdependent and reliant upon each other. So we're seeing a huge market convergence that is unstoppable in my opinion. Currently, we're seeing a tail off on the industry because the consumer led, the consumer boom in the, in the Far East in terms of production has dropped off because of the worldwide inflation and runaway interest rates. But actually, the underlying forecast for shipments and the technology business is up and to the right, to the point where it's going to grow rapidly. And by 2032, we're going to see a business that's worth something in the region of 1.3 trillion. So it's taken 40 to 45 years to reach $650 billion, which is impressive in itself. But if you then consider that in the next 10 years, that's going to double again. There may be a downturn today caused by external influences, but the underlying trend in our industry and everything we're involved in together is distinctly up and to the right and will remain so. In fact, we will, we will probably see something in the region of 7% compound annual growth rate in our industry for at least the next 10, if not 15 to 20 years. And there are very few industries in the world that can match that. 91% of all chip business takes place in Taiwan. 54% of all chip production is through TSMC. How many people buy TSMC chips? Answer, all of us. He just doesn't say TSMC on the package. The world's largest global foundry. Okay, But when you look at the centricity of all that, it's a concern. We're in a truly global business, or are we? There's an estimated 250 plus companies in China not yet exporting. We've seen the emergence of some during the chip shortage, and that will continue because they've actually filled the gaps that some of the more traditional companies haven't been able to supply. But throughout history, it's well recognized that Silicon Valley was a leader. Europe was very heavily involved in the early days. Companies like SGS and Thompson that became ST, for those that can remember that far back. But then the Japanese quickly became involved, especially with the memory business in the 80s, followed by Taiwan, Korea, and now China. And that will continue. It wouldn't surprise me at all in the next five to 10 years, fab start opening up in other lower cost centers of manufacturing, such as India. So how's the industry responding? America, $350 billion, take that, okay? Let's go and build fabs everywhere. We're gonna produce devices. How long does it take to commission a fab? It's not 12 months, it's not 24, it's barely 36. It's four years by the time you put a state-of-the-art fab together, spend $13 billion and start producing it capacity. So anything going in the ground now won't have a material impact on the semiconductor supply chain for, until at least the end of 2026. The West is trying to square the chip production circle. And will it be enough? My forecast is it won't. I think we are seeing a slight reduction in lead times at the moment, and it's softening a bit with some pricing, especially on commodities. But the up, I think the longer term trend is that semiconductor lead times will continue to remain tough, and pricing will, conti will continue to remain firm. The, the really interesting thing about our world is that the natural acquisition and application of technology will continue to drive demand hard. And I can only kind of express that in, in that, that the human race is obsessed by technology. All of us brushed our teeth this morning, I hope. How many of us have got a toothbrush that buzzes? Well, it's probably got a four-bit micro in it, that's why. It might, some have got eight-bit if you're paying seven pounds for a toothbrush. But from this toothbrush to the metaverse, technology has become completely ubiquitous and pervasive. And that will continue. We've got a thirst and a hunger for it that's insatiable. And that's going to, try, that's going to drive huge demand and uh, create huge stresses in the supply chain as we go forward. 
I believe the industry will struggle to keep pace with demand over time. And the Chinese and eventually others will truly enter the global market. As WPG, we've got a unique eye on those markets right now and their potential entry into uh, EMEA. And please feel free to come and visit us today. Sorry, that was a plug. Okay. The West will continue to try and balance the equation. There's no reason why it shouldn't. And in fact, a balanced global supply chain is exactly what we need. And we haven't got it today. So future expectations and behavior with three and a half minutes to go. I'm well within my time frame. I, I did it on Friday and I was three and a half minutes over, I overran. Expect continued change and turbulence. It's been a characteristic of our industry from day one. And in fact, the industry itself drives change and turbulence everywhere. So why shouldn't it be um, the victim of it as well? Plan for the price to remain firm. Design as generically as you can. As hardware designers, make your systems as adaptable and as flexible as you can. Because going down uh, polarized single channel sources is a danger. And I know that many people have been experienced the downsides of that in the last two to three years. Maximize the flexibility of your supply chain. I know there's a lot of people onshoring right now from production ab abroad. You mix it, match it, whatever your business requires, do it. But be, be cons consider, consider all the, the uh, influencing factors of a uh, global supply chain. And I think as a watchword, Always expect the unexpected in our business because it tends to happen, okay? That's enough from me. Um, I'd be delighted to take any questions in the two and a half minutes I have left. Excellent. <laughs> I've already explained what WPG stands for, so I can't do that one again. As, question to the floor. How many of us in the room, just quick show of hands, have experienced significant supply chain issues in the production of your products? How many of us have solved those problems successfully? How many have issues remaining that are a real issue to you now that's preventing your business moving forward as you would like it to? Two, two well, some are, okay. Um, three, three years ago, if I'd have bought a semiconductor company from China to some, a major tier one OEM, I wouldn't have got through the door for all the reasons we know, the trust, politics, etc. Now they're being invited in because some of the more um, renowned tier one suppliers that we all know and love have let those customers down badly. So we haven't before primarily due to historic reasons and the fact that China itself hasn't geared up to export. Okay, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of nationally owned semiconductor companies that aren't ready yet, but they will be, in the same way the Koreans weren't, but that, that managed it, and the same with Japan. So prepare for it. Um, it is part of the, it's part of the future semiconductor supply chain without question. Yes, sir? Uh, not to the same degree, but yes, I, I, read a, I read a number of about 85 billion euro in the press last weekend. I'm not sure where those fabs are actually going in, but they are, they are being created. So Europe will play a part in the future expansion of the semiconductor supply. Yes, Kevin. Yeah. Um, like closing the door after the horse has already bolted. I find punitive sanctions in that respect to be ultimately, this is just a personal opinion, counterproductive rather than productive. Someone else, somewhere else, that they will achieve what they need to achieve. Um, you know, we've got, <laughs> where we can, try and remove the politics and the economics, it's not an easy thing to do in the, uh, in the globe, uh, at any level, yet alone the, the semiconductor business. But, I'm not sure how successful that will be in the long term, Kevin. Short term, yeah, it will have an impact. But then it will only impact everyone in this room who are trying to buy product to build your own end product to be successful in your markets. So I'd be a bit cautious about how, how viable that strategy is going forward. I'm bang on 10 o'clock. Any more questions? Yes, it is, yeah. Yes, it is. And so, and if, if we look at our, um, if we look at some of our, our more esteemed uh, Far Eastern suppliers, I'll get, give you a very quick example. I've got a line called Fitty Power, F-I-T-I-E-Y, -I -I 
I P O W E R. It's a weird name, but when you break it down into its syllables, it's Fit Ti Power. It's a bunch of guys that's left Ti in Taiwan, set up a company selling, guess what? Emulated Ti Power products. And they're doing tremendously well. So you're quite right. That, that's where the mass market is required to, in order to fulfill the supply chain. And you're also correct in that saying that the higher end investment going in, especially in the EU, is for the higher end technologies. But we're going to need it all. I mean, we're seeing recently companies in the AI sector scaling back their costs slightly at the moment. But that's only a, that's only a correction factor because AI will be with us. Of that, there's no question whatsoever. It's just a question of timing when the cycle actually does pick up and to the right. I think I'm done. Am I? Yep. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Really enjoyed it. Thanks.